A sketch of Pope Julius, made many years earlier, he idealized into a portrait of Moses. The marble still trembles with a lightning alertness. He is poised to defend the Lord's unshakable law. Leo X made a triumphant entry into Florence. He graciously bestowed titles of nobility on Michelangelo's family and requested a tomb for the glory of the Medici dead. Moses and the vaults of the Sistine exalted the power of life. Now his spirit subsided into a serene meditation on death. eternal silence. In the dream world of the dead, Lorenzo and his cousin Giuliano contemplate the Madonna and child. Symbol of eternal truth. Lorenzo, grandson of the magnificent, personifies the contemplative life. He has shaken off the torments of the living expressed in the figures below. Dawn heavily drags herself awake to another day of pain.
doesn't even attempt the struggle of the living. The burden of his hopelessness weighs him down. Giuliano slain in the Pazzi revolt, personifies the active life. struggles in her sleep with the torment of her dreams. Their murky symbols lie scattered on her couch. Day awakens in a rage. There is terror in his eyes. seem to force open the tombs, releasing the souls of the dead who live forever in the presence of the Lord. All the tensions of human time, dawn, twilight, night, and day, are resolved in the harmonies of eternal time. After the completion of the Medici Chapel, the whole of Italy held Michelangelo in awe. For Pope Clement VII, he now built the Laurentian Library to house the fabulous literary collection of the Medici. The manuscripts of Dante, Virgil, Petrarch, and Tacitus, among others. The storehouse of humanistic learning. As in his sculpture, he conceived the library with forms locked in tensions which are never resolved. The columns are imprisoned in the walls. The scrolls lead nowhere. Even where the staircase flows freely upward, there is a counterflow on either side. The enslaved room not only expressed his own inner conflicts, but symbolized a time out of joint. A spirit of religious reform was sweeping Europe. Luther was thundering in Germany. The North was in revolt. Rome had been sacked, and Pope Clement was prisoner in Castel Sant'Angelo. Having lost half of Europe, Clement took a new course. He allied himself with the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. 
his former enemy, and together they launched an offensive against Florence. Within the city, there were riots and disorder, stirred up by Medici partisans. The gates were closed, but the turmoil continued. David himself was wounded. A missile flung from a balcony shattered his arm. Michelangelo, sculptor, architect, painter, poet, now became a man of battle. He was commissioned general in charge of fortifications. To safeguard the city's outposts, he fortified the mountain stronghold of San Miniato. His efforts were of no avail. The city fell. The Protestant upheaval provoked a new spirit of reform in Catholic Rome. This renewed faith also ruled the Vatican, and Pope Paul III begged the master to lend his genius to the struggle of the church militant fighting for its very life. Once more, Michelangelo came to the Sistine Chapel. Wearily, the 60-year-old man mounted the scaffold to paint his last judgment. The upheaval of Christendom, fusing with his own bitter turmoil, unleashed all the furies of his genius. For five anguished years, he drove himself to the point of exhaustion and beyond. When at last he had finished, the altar wall blazed out with an apocalyptic vision of final judgment. A sinful and stunned humanity churns in the torrents of his day of wrath. In a gesture of insane rage, he seems to skin himself alive. On the tattered skin which St. Bartholomew presents to the Lord is painted Michelangelo's own tragic mask. It was as though he had ripped the Renaissance completely out of his system. Savonarola's thundering prophecies had never left his mind. Now they rang out in a deafening blast of doom. When the fevered tempo of his rage had spent itself, Michelangelo collapsed. Members of the Strazzi family, old-time friends from Florence, took him to their estate at Tivoli. peaceful sun-bathed surroundings, his health was gradually restored. Now recovered, Michelangelo returned to Rome. As chief architect of the city, his work on palaces, gardens, and churches 
gave Rome a living grandeur which matched his vision of ancient Rome. For the reconstruction of the Capitol Square, he designed a splendid staircase in marble and decorated it with antique statues. In the center of the square, he erected an imposing figure of Marcus Aurelius. The handsome staircase of the palace of the Senate lent new dignity to the capital. Overwhelmed with public duties, he still found time to continue work on his own sculpture. At 75, he was regarded with almost religious reverence. And now the Pope asked him to redesign St. Peter's, to build a monument worthy of the church triumphant. He had to cut through a tangle of plans submitted by all the leading architects. His own was a triumph of clarity. He was prevailed upon to construct a working model of the dome to assure its completion in the event of his death. It was the greatest of all domes made up to that time. Now in the last years of his life, he worked in his modest studio near the Trajan Forum, avoiding all contact with the papal court and Roman nobility. Here in the shadows of St. Peter's, he labored to outwit death, but his health was failing. I'm broken, shattered, torn asunder. I am nothing but a bag of bones and nerves. I'm like a scarecrow set in a field. A spider hangs in one of my ears, and in the other, a 
cricket chirps all night long. The scarecrow was making another pieta. Figures that once trembled with power now crumble in a vibrant throb. He is discouraged. In a servitude that weighs on me, in the great disgust, in the great distress of soul, with all my human weakness, I must still fashion out of stone human beings made to the image of God. Now his eyes turn inward, and his hands give form to the tremors of his soul. It is one of his last works, the descent from the cross. And the face of the old man, Nicodemus, who is looking toward Jesus, is the face of the sculptor himself. Ill with all the troubles which are wont to afflict old men. I am so old that death pulls at my sleeve, for she fears that I may forget. I will not forget. I know, he said, the creator will go, but his work survives. That is why, to escape death, I attempt to bind my soul to my work. <laughs> 